Hello, and welcome to the sky this month. Um, this is going to be a short talk about what you can see in the sky that's interesting and how to see it. And then I'll do a little bit at the end about um, photography in the city and how you get around issues like light pollution. Um, so I am Oscar. I am the Equipment and Observations Officer for AstroSoc, um, which basically means I'm in charge of all the telescopes and running observation sessions when the sky isn't cloudy. Um, and yeah, I've been asked to give this talk. Um, it's sort of a, a thing my predecessors have done as well. Um, so yeah, we'll get into it. So quite lucky tonight is a full moon. Um, whether it's cloudy or not um, is to be seen, but um, the moon is a really good um, target all year round with brilliant views for both telescope and binoculars. Um, and you can see it both day and night. In fact, during the day, um, some of the contrast you get means some of the craters are even easier to see. Um, so it cycles between new and full. When it's a new moon, it's really good because um, you lose that source of light in the sky. So it's really good to see galaxies and nebulae and some of the uh, dimmer objects. And then when it's full, you can see the full moon and you can see all the seas and it's a really pretty object to observe. Um, the other thing that's around at the moment all the time are the planets. We've got Jupiter, Saturn, and Venus are all visible. Um, so uh, Venus is very low in the sky. You've got to be out sort of just before sunset to see it. Um, and then as the sun comes down, you look towards where the sun is sitting, and you should see a bright dot in the sky. Um, Jupiter and Saturn are quite close together. I'll show you in a second how you can find them. Um, and they are two very bright dots in the sky, again, towards sort of the southwest. Um, you can get really good views with both telescope and binoculars. Um, you can see some of the moons around Jupiter. You can see the rings of Saturn, um, even with just a, a half decent pair of binoculars. Um, so I'd really recommend if you can get out one evening when it's clear, try and find the planets, have a look. Um, you, will not be, you will not be disappointed. Um, so here you go. Towards the south, you can see both Jupiter and Saturn. Um, basically, all the stars you can see on there are quite dim. So if you look to the south, you look a little bit up from the horizon, they should both be really obvious. Um, and these slides will be up on the Astro in the City website so that you can reference this later if you so wish. Now, going into the months, we're in October at the moment, um, you've got the Orionid meteor shower. Um, which is a really good one. Uh, you've got basically a meteor every about four minutes, peaking on the 21st. So you want to get out as soon as you can to see that. Um, and that's in the Orion constellation, which is currently visible after 10 p.m. Um, you also got Mercury at greatest elongation. So Mercury is very small, very close to the sun. So it's normally quite hard to see because, you know, it's always around the sun and the sun is bright, so you can't see it. Um, but Mercury greatest elongation means it's currently, or it's heading up to its furthest point. Um, and that's going to be on the 25th, so that's in just a few days as well. Um, so you want to be up early in the morning, about 6.30, if you want to see it, um, just when it gets above the horizon, but the sun hasn't fully come up yet. Um, and then we got a moon, and that's the full moon today. Uh, in November, we've got Again, some, some interesting events. Uh, Asteroid 67P is going to be its brightest. Um, this is quite a significant, um, it's actually a comet, it's quite significant, because in 2016, a lander launched by the ESA, the European Space en Agency, touched down on the surface, and that was the first time a lander um, touched down on the surface of an asteroid. Um, it's unfortunately not visible to the naked eye, um, but it's the brightest comet for a while. Um, and can be located with a large telescope if you have that. I mean, it's not something you're likely to see, but it's interesting that it's there. And it's interesting that it still has this lander on it from 2016. Um, you also have the Moon and Venus conjunction. So um, the Moon is going to cover the planet on the 8th of November. Um, and sort of the two will have share the same coordinates in the sky for the night. And then we've got another meteor shower. This is, again, this is um, the Leonid meteor shower. So it's in the Leo constellation. Um, and this is, again, quite a good one. You've got meteors observable for every four minutes. 
So if you're outside for like a good 15 minutes, you should see a number of meteors. Um, and that is in the Leo constellation. Um, and the peak is running, that will be for a good few weeks, but the peak of it will be on the 17th, if you want to get out for that time. We also have a new moon and a full moon in November. Um, so if you want to be looking at the sort of deeper, deeper sky stuff that's a bit fainter, you want the new moon um, and the full moon if you want to look at the moon. And then December, we have a new moon on the 4th and a full moon on the 19th. Uh, got the winter solstice, uh, which is the longest day of the year, or the longest night of the year even. So you can, yeah, if you're an astronomer, this is great. If you're anywhere, if you're anyone else, it isn't so much great. But it does mean you can be out and looking at the stars for several hours before even dinner time. Um, lots of people don't like it. I quite like it. Um, and then there's a total solar eclipse. Unfortunately, it's an it's in Antarctica. So if you fancy a last minute flight, then um, that's definitely one to look out for. So then I just wanted to talk a little bit about photography. So some of the uh, previous equipment officers have talked in the past about another subject that's interesting. And one of the things I do in my spare time is astrophotography, which means I use my telescope and my camera and I take pictures of space. And here are some of the pictures I've taken. So you've got the Horsehead Nebula on the left, which is in the Orion constellation. You've got the North American Nebula, which is in the Cygnus constellation, and you've got the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, and one of the issues with photography is that you have to contend with a lot of factors, and one of those is light pollution. Now, we're in Birmingham at the moment, not all of you may be from Birmingham, um, but no matter where you are, light pollution is going to be an issue, um, even if you're in a small town. And Birmingham, this is a particular issue. Um, so we need to have ways to get around that. And the way we do that is with filters. Um, so you have what are called narrow band filters. And these let in only certain wavelengths of light. So rather than taking the entire spectrum, um, you have a very small narrow band, hence the name, um, which correspond to specific emissions from specific atoms. So these are the three common ones. You can see you've got hydrogen alpha, silicon two, no, sulfur two, and oxygen three. So you have, these are the three standard uh, filters. And then you have these and you have your camera, and then it only lets in this bit, very narrow band of light, which then excludes most of the light pollution, which means rather than having a very bright washed out image, you get quite a nice clear click at image. And that's how you uh, do photography even when you have light pollution in a big city. So thank you very much for listening. Um, hope you have a great evening and enjoy the next talk. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Dr. Matt Nickel. I'm a lecturer in astronomy here at the University of Birmingham. And tonight I'm gonna to talk to you about supernovae. So let's just start with a few simple definitions. So you might have heard the term nova before. A nova is basically what happens when some material falls onto a white dwarf star and it releases a very bright burst. It can appear to be as bright as 100,000 suns. So from our perspective here on Earth, this bright burst looks like a brand new star has appeared in the sky because this white dwarf wasn't bright enough to see previously. So the name nova comes from the Latin word for new as in this new star that seems to have appeared. Now a supernova is something much more powerful again. A supernova is an explosion that happens to some stars at the end of their lives. And these supernova explosions can be brighter than a billion times the brightness of our sun. So much more powerful and much more spectacular than, uh, than these regular novae. So let's uh, make this a bit more uh, clear with an example. So this is a picture of a, of a real galaxy, um, the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see lots and lots of stars in this image. So one of these stars is about to go supernova. So let's um, flick this on and see if you can spot which star explodes. <laughs> it's pretty obvious, right? Um, you see this source here is now brighter than all the other stars in this galaxy, basically brighter than most of the other stars put together. Uh, so if I just flick back and forth, you can see the difference. So this, this is a supernova. Um, it's quite a famous supernova, actually. It's called Supernova 1987A. So this galaxy I showed was the Large Magellanic Cloud. 
The LMC is the closest galaxy to the Milky Way, which is our own galaxy. And on a clear night in the southern hemisphere from a nice dark site, you can actually see the large Magellanic Clouds. This is it here, rising above these telescopes. Um, and the supernova that exploded in this galaxy, 1987A, was uh, sufficiently bright and nearby that the people were able to see it with the naked eye. So it must have been a very impressive sight back in 1987. Now, one of the main reasons this supernova was so important, apart from being so bright and so nearby, was because actually the, the pre-explosion image showed the star uh, before it actually exploded. So you can see that star labeled here. It looks pretty uh, anonymous amongst all the others here. So we didn't know what it was about to do. And down here we have pictures from after the supernova. So it exploded in 1987. Here it is seven years later in 1994 and more images all the way up until 2016. And there's two things to notice about these images. One is that as the explosion itself fades away over the years, we can see that there's no star left behind. So this is how we know that supernovae are actually the final explosions that end the life of the star. There's no star there once the supernova glow is faded. And what was really surprising about this one uh, was this beautiful circle here uh, this is a ring of material that must have been lost by the star sometime during its lifetime. And the explosion has actually lit up this uh, sort of circular shell of gas here, um, giving these really spectacular images. So 1987 was the last time there was a naked eye supernova that we could see here from Earth. But uh, finding the supernovae by eye is actually one of the oldest branches. Um, Certainly of astronomy, but, but maybe one of the oldest branches in science. So a supernova close enough to see with the naked eye happens only about once a century. So those supernovae happen all through the universe. To see them with the naked eye, they have to be very close by. So that means essentially within our own galaxy, the Milky Way, or a very nearby galaxy like the LMC, or, the, or its neighbor, the small Magellanic Clouds. And throughout history, many civilizations have reported seeing these supernovae in the sky. So here's an artist's impression of um, Tycho Brahe, a famous uh, Danish astronomer, uh, looking up at this newly discovered supernova that appeared uh, apparently as a new star in, 19, I'm sorry, in 1572. Now with modern telescopes, we can point in the direction of these historical uh, supernovae and see what they actually left behind, these expanding clouds of, um, of nebulae or supernova remnants. So let's look at a few examples of those. So this is the oldest known supernova, this is SN 185, because it was discovered in the year 185 AD, so nearly 2000 years ago, recorded by ancient Chinese astronomers. Uh, it must have looked very bright in AD 185. This is it today. Um, we can't see it with our eyes anymore, but with telescopes we can see now these expanding shells of gas as they uh, make their way out into the interstellar medium. This one, supernova 1006, is uh, probably the brightest stellar event in recorded history. It's nearly every uh, continent, you know, a thousand years ago, has a record of this uh, appearing as a very bright source in the sky uh, that must have been about 10 times brighter than how Venus looks as seen from Earth today. So that was incredibly bright. Uh, and now a thousand years later, this um, bubble-shaped remnant is about 60 light years across because it's, it's continuing to expand uh, over all that time. And there's lots more of these supernova remnants. Uh, so here's some nice pictures of uh, some of my favorites. So here's the one that Tycho found in 1572. Uh, Johannes Kepler also found one in 1604, only 30 years later. Uh, so that would have been a good time to be alive to see both of these. In the middle is the very famous Crab Nebula. This is a remnant of a supernova from 1054. And at the bottom here, uh, this is probably my favorite, Cassiopeia A, so this nice jet-like structure um, popping out one side. Now this one actually wasn't seen by eye, or at least there's no recorded records of it, so we actually find this one via the remnant. Uh, and similarly, the, the other two on the sides, these um, predate any of our records. So these ones um, probably exploded in 600 BC in, in this case, and maybe 2500 BC over here. So these supernovae weren't recorded at the time, but we can trace back the expansion of the, of the shells and work out when the size would have been um, shrunk back down to that of a star. Uh, and that's, that's how we date these um, supernovae with no records of um, having seen the explosion. 
So we haven't had a naked eye supernova since 1987, and we haven't had a supernova in our own Milky Way galaxy for even longer. But there's plenty of stars in our galaxy that, that could produce the next galactic or naked eye supernova. Um, some of the best examples are in this constellation, you might recognize as Orion. So here's Orion's belt in the middle. Uh, and these two stars, Betelgeuse and Rigel, are both uh, supermassive, supergiant stars that um, could well explode in uh, the not too distant future. So fingers crossed that we get to see a galactic supernova um, in our times. But this is not how we find supernovae anymore. Um, robotic telescopes rather than the naked eye do the work for us. So here's an example of some of the new robotic telescopes that are really revolutionizing our understanding of supernova explosions. And these are all over the world. These are the PanStars and Atlas telescopes in Hawaii. Here's the Zwicky Transient Facility in California, one of the Assassin telescopes in Chile, uh, and this is the newest one, GoTo, in the Canary Islands. So what all these telescopes do uh, is that they automatically point all over the sky and they, with very large fields of view, here's some of their um, cameras to show how wide these fields of view are, uh, they can cover the whole sky in just uh, one or two nights. So for example, here's the camera from PTF compared to the size of the full moon. You see that it covers an area much larger. But the telescope that's really gonna, gonna change our understanding of supernovae is the Vera Rubin Observatory. So this is currently under construction in Chile. So it's got a field of view of around 10 square degrees. So it's a very big camera. Uh, but what's even more impressive, it's actually the first uh, wide field telescope with a, also has a very large mirror. So it's got an eight meter diameter primary mirror and that means a huge light collecting area. So it's got both a very uh, high capacity to collect light, which means it can see very far into the universe, and also a very large CCD camera, which means it can see very wide. So the combination means it can search a larger volume of space than has ever been searched before to try and find new things exploding throughout the universe. So these robotic telescopes are finding thousands of supernovae every single night, or thousands of potential supernovae, and these are not nearby objects in our galaxy, but rather explosions in distant galaxies throughout the universe. So an example is shown here of this beautiful galaxy, and uh, this is famous supernova 2011 FE appearing in the galaxy. So our challenge now is to sort through all these possible supernovae that are popping up everywhere and figure out their properties and which ones need further investigation to try and understand something about how these stars live and die. So let's think about why this might be the case. Uh, why do supernovae actually occur? So uh, throughout the star's lifetime, you've got two main forces that act on the star. Gravity is always trying to compress the star and pull this material inwards because they're, they're so massive. Uh, whereas in the core of the star, nuclear reactions supply the heat and pressure to, to stop it collapsing under gravity. So by nuclear reactions, uh, I mean fusion reactions here, where you have small atoms that combine together to make heavier atoms. So hydrogen combines together to make helium here, for example. And this releases some energy that, that supports the star. And that's essentially what happens throughout most of the lifetime of, of any star that you might see. So there's two ways in which a star can get from this um, sort of stable reaction stage to a supernova, and it depends on the mass of the star. So let's start with the low mass stars. So low mass stars, we basically mean anything less than eight times the mass of the sun. So our, our sun's a very typical low mass star. So in these stars, um, fusion reactions in the core eventually turn all the hydrogen and helium into carbon and oxygen. And these stars don't get hot enough to, to fuse together anything heavier than that. So essentially all these nuclear reactions stop once the core is made of carbon and oxygen. At that point, the core starts to cool down and the outer layers of the star get blown away uh, as this beautiful wind called a planetary nebula. So I think after the supernova remnants, the planetary nebula are pro probably the most beautiful images that we have um, of these extended structures. What's left behind after this planetary nebula phase is a white dwarf. So a white dwarf is the, the carbon and oxygen core of the star, uh, and it's comparable in size to a planet like the Earth, as shown in this um, artist's impression. So these white dwarfs, um, if nothing happens, they'll just sit there forever, getting gradually colder and colder. Uh, and uh, in trillions and trillions of years, they'll turn into a, a black dwarf whenever they're, they're no longer producing any heat or releasing any heat. But uh, if the white dwarf gains some material, it can have a very different fate. 
So it turns out the white dwarfs above 1.4 times the mass of the sun are completely unstable. If a white dwarf gains some material and goes over this mass limit, it suddenly burns through all the material left, so all the carbon and oxygen uh, that couldn't be fused together before, suddenly they all get fused together at once and it releases so much energy that it causes the star to blow up entirely. So we call this a type 1a supernova. And this can happen if the star is in a binary system with a companion where by gravity this white dwarf can gain some material off its neighbor. So we find plenty of these um, throughout the universe, these type 1a or white dwarf supernovae. The other way a star can explode is what happens to high mass stars. So this is stars more than eight times the mass of the sun. So in this case, uh, fusion reactions proceed much more vigorously because of um, these stars get much hotter. And in this case, the fusion goes beyond carbon and oxygen and makes atoms all the way up to iron. So iron is actually the heaviest element that you can use for nuclear fusion. So once you get to that point, uh, there's nothing left to, su to support the star from gravitational collapse. Uh, and at this point, when the core is entirely turned into iron, it collapses from around the size of the Earth to just a few kilometers across, or you know, roughly the size of Birmingham, in less than a second. Uh, and it leaves behind sometimes a black hole, but more often probably uh, a neutron star. So a neutron star has the density of a, an atomic nucleus, but is uh, something like 10 kilometers across. This is, this is material famously, a teaspoon would weigh something like a, a billion tons. So it's apart from a black hole, the densest thing in the universe. Now the energy released uh, in this collapse, basically all the gravitational energy of the core of the star gets released at once. And this is enough to blow up the outer layers of the star. And we call this a core collapse or type two supernova. Uh, and this uh, picture here, this remnant of Cassiopeia A, this is a good example of a remnant of a core collapse supernova. So if I zoom in, you can actually see uh, in this X-ray image, the X-rays from the neutron star left behind. Um, so this is the, the original core of our star. And this is the envelope that's now spread out to uh, a very large size over the, the 500 years of expansion. So what do we actually see as observers here on Earth when the supernova explodes? Uh, so there's a couple of different things that produce um, the light that we can see. So when the star initially explodes, first of all, we see a very bright flash as the blast wave that blows up the star escapes through the surface. So this bright flash, uh, it's only bright in, in sort of the visible light for a few days. And it's this, it's this peak here on this graph of brightness versus time. So this first peak lasts for a few days, uh, but, but the shock wave that produces it keeps expanding into space through the interstellar medium. And we can see X-ray and radio emission from the front of this blast wave uh, for centuries after the explosion. So these are the supernova remnants we see today. Uh, a lot of it is the emission from this blast wave proceeding out through space. So as the visible light from the blast wave fades away, if nothing else was to happen, the supernova would only be bright for a few days. But in fact, all the energy produced by the explosion uh, actually makes a lot of radioactive material um, inside the ejected stellar um, mass. So uh, primarily this is unstable nickel, nickel 56 we call it, and this decays to cobalt and then decay, that decays to iron. And all these radioactive decays also produce lots of heat and light. Uh, and this causes the, the supernova to last for much longer. So the second um, brightness peak here is from the radioactive decays, and this lasts for maybe a few weeks or months. So this keeps the supernova bright for a long time. Now, uh, those are the, the fantastic bursts. So the next question is where to find them. And the answer usually is to look at massive galaxies. And this is because where you have lots of stars, you have more chance of seeing a supernova. So here's a beautiful example here, supernova 1994D, uh, and this beautiful edge on galaxy here. Uh, and the second thing to look for is star forming regions, because these, especially the core collapse supernovae, uh, the stars that produce them don't last for very long. The, a massive star lives for around 10 million years, whereas a star like our sun lives for 10 billion years. So with a, a thousand times shorter lifetime, these massive stars don't get to move very far between when they're born and when they die. And so they tend to explode close to regions that are still forming new stars today. So an example here shows a star exploding in sort of one of the clumps in the spiral arm of this nice face on galaxy. So put these, things to, put these two things together and what do we see? Here's a video of, of a supernova 
fading away over a month or so uh, inside this sort of star forming region of this uh, nice spiral galaxy. So we'll just let that play again. You can see the supernova fading over time as the brightness drops pretty dramatically. And we have a little bit of residual light here um, as it gets very old. So that's what most supernovae look like. But uh, with all these new robotic telescopes and our ability to survey large volumes of space, we started to find a whole new kind of supernova out there in the universe. And these supernovae uh, stood out because they don't seem to have any visible host galaxy when we detect them. So lots of examples are shown here. You know, if you didn't know that this was, was uh, appearing suddenly and then fading away, it might just look like a regular star. So it's only by repeatedly visiting these parts of the sky and seeing the brightness change that we can tell these are supernovae at all. And these uh, apparently host galaxy free supernovae, they make up about one out of every 1000 supernovae that we see. And what's really puzzling about these uh, orphan supernovae is that they're also very often much brighter than the conventional supernovae. So uh, this graph shows the luminosity versus time for normal supernovae down here. And you can see the peak here caused by the radioactive decays. Uh, the super, these new supernovae, we call them superluminous supernovae because they live up here. So it's a hundred times or a thousand times brighter than the, the supernovae that we've known about for centuries. As well as being much brighter, they often uh, last a bit longer too. So this one's fading away very slowly. And it's been a huge puzzle for the last 10 years or so what actually causes these supernovae to be so bright. And this is what a lot of my research is focused on. The first question uh, we'll ask here is, are these objects really hostless? Do they really explode with no surrounding galaxy? And the answer is probably no. So although these appear to be um, exploding in the middle of nowhere, essentially, once the supernova light has faded away, we can zoom in on the galaxies. This is a zoom in with the Hubble Space Telescope. And this little dot here is a, is a superluminous supernova. Uh, two years and three years after the explosion. And you can still see quite a lot of light even at these very late, late stages compared to the explosion. But you can also see this extended structure here and this is the host galaxy. So it's a very compact blue galaxy where this explosion took place. So we don't think that they're really hostless. It's just that the galaxies are so faint we didn't see them there uh, before the supernova went off. And it's only by, by zooming in um, a high magnification that we actually see these galaxies at all. So why is it that these superluminous supernovae only seem to explode in uh, low mass or what we call dwarf galaxies? So we're not really sure, um, but there's one good theory that probably is uh, part of this, is that galaxies that have low masses also tend to have low metal contents. So in astronomy, metal means anything heavier than hydrogen or helium. And uh, you can see here the, the strong correlation between the galaxy mass and the amount of metals. So superluminous supernovae are these blue points and they all seem to occur uh, in this region where there's low mass galaxies that have low metal content. So there's something about having a lot of metals in your stars that prevents you from getting superluminous supernovae. And we're trying to understand right now what that is. The other question, of course, is why are these objects so bright? Why are they superluminous? So I'm going to run through a few possible explanations uh, and we'll see which we think is the most feasible. So perhaps the most uh, obvious explanation would be if these are 100 times brighter than a normal supernova, does that mean they produce 100 times more radioactive material or radioactive nickel to heat the explosion? Um, well, to do that, you need to have a star that's around 100 times heavier than the usual supernova uh, producing stars. These very, very heavy stars exploding uh, by a different mechanism again, we call it a pair instability supernova. Uh, but the key point is that the explosion of such a massive star with, with 100 or 200 times the mass of the Sun would give a supernova that brightens and fades much too slowly compared to our observations. So these things would stay bright for years and years and years. But uh, actually we do think uh, from theoretical reasons that these very massive um, parent stability supernovae should be out there somewhere. So hopefully in the future we will actually find the explosions of these 200 solar mass stars. So we don't think that that causes the known superluminous supernovae. So what else uh, might be happening? Another explanation is that um, if the supernova collides with some dense gas close to the explosion, it can turn some of its energy into light. Uh, so this is by the, the actual collision between the supernova and some slower moving material that can release uh, a lot of that energy. 
And we saw from 1987a that these stars do lose material during their life and you can have these shells of sort of circumstellar material. So um, that's probably where it would come from is, is from the star itself prior to the explosion. Uh, and this probably does explain some of the superluminous supernovae because in some of them we see from spectroscopy uh, evidence for slow moving material close to the supernova. So that's a plausible explanation for many of these objects, but in many others, uh, probably the majority, we don't see any evidence for this slow moving gas. So, so I don't think that this mechanism can explain all of the superluminous supernovae that we see. So that leaves us with um, something hidden inside the explosion rather than outside. And perhaps the most plausible candidate for this is um, the neutron star that we think is left behind from the star's core. So we know that, that most or nearly all supernovae leave behind neutron stars. We know from studying neutron stars in our own galaxy that some of them rotate very quickly and anything that's spinning very fast has a large energy. We also know from studying neutron stars um, in our own galaxy that some of them have very strong magnetic fields. In fact, neutron stars can be the most magnetic objects in the universe. Um, in, the, in the most extreme cases, they could wipe your credit card information from the distance of the moon. Uh, but what we could also have is a neutron star that has both a very strong magnetic field and a very fast spin. And this allows it to use its, its energy from the rotation um, to give this through the magnetic field to the supernova explosion itself. So this uh, fast spinning, very magnetic neutron star is what we call a magnetar. And this magnetar basically acts as an engine as it spins and this can heat up the supernova to very high temperatures and make it very, very bright. So there's lots of different tests that we tried to apply um, to look for these uh, signatures of magnetars inside the explosion. Uh, I think the most convincing probably is what happens when we follow the supernova for a very long time. So this is the, the same object we saw in the Hubble image uh, with observations at two and three years after the explosion. And you can see that uh, as it fades, the rate of fading actually slows down in a way that's quite close to the predictions um, from these magnetar models. So what basically happens is that as the, the magnetar uses up its energy, it spins slower and slower. And the slower it spins, the slower it provides energy to the supernova. So the rate of decline gets slower with time as well. So this is uh, quite good evidence that probably they do have these highly magnetic fast spinning neutron stars inside the centers uh, of these most extreme explosions. So we think that the fast spinning magnetar is probably present in most superluminous supernovae and, uh, and some fracks them also have additional luminosity from colliding with the slow moving gas. But there's lots of things that we don't know about these objects. Um, there's still active questions of study. We're still trying to understand why they only form in these low mass metal per galaxies. We need to try and understand how the stars actually lose the material before the explosion and, and why only sometimes it's near enough that they can catch up with it. We need to understand how these stars actually spin fast enough to make these magnetars. Does this need to have another nearby companion in a binary system to keep it rotating rapidly? Uh, and we're still on the lookout for these superluminous pair instability supernovae um, that might come from the most massive stars in the universe. So although there's lots of open questions, I think the field for this, uh, the future of this field is very, very bright, or <laughs> to use a really bad pun, the future is superluminous. Uh, for a number of reasons. So one is the upcoming Vera Rubin Observatory that I mentioned before. So this will be operational in about two years time and uh, with its very wide field of view and its very large light collecting area, this should find around a thousand superluminous supernovae per year. Uh, and to put that in context, in the last 10 years we've only found a uh, hundred or so of these events. So this will really uh, allow us to see much more diversity within this population and see all the different things that these superluminous supernovae can do. The other really exciting thing coming up soon is the James Webb Space Telescope. So after uh, a number of well-publicized delays, this, uh, this is supposed to launch in December of this year, just two months. And the, the JWST will be able to see superluminous supernovae from the very distant universe that might come from stars exploding within the first billion years after the Big Bang. Uh, and interestingly, we expect to see more massive stars in the early universe, 
uh, and stars in the early universe also have lower metal content. So we might get much more superluminous supernovae in the early universe than what we get today. And finally, uh, we have lots of new ways to study the explosive universe now. We have gravitational waves that can detect very nearby supernovae or other energetic cosmic collisions. We have uh, what we call multi-messenger astronomy, where we can combine together what we see in visible light with not just gravitational waves, but also high energy particles that get emitted from some of these explosions. And we also have entirely new kinds of explosions for us to study, which includes um, some things that I'm very interested in now. Tidal disruption events, where a star passes too close to a supermassive black hole, uh, and what's called kilonovae, where two neutron stars collide together and produce a lot of heavy radioactive material. So uh, it's a very exciting time for this field with all these new facilities, and we should find out a lot more in the next few years. So thank you very much for listening to this talk.